Earth. Fire. Air. Water. Only the Avatar can master all four elements and bring balance to the world. Hey everyone, Dave here for Geek Vision at Kineticon, and I am thrilled to be sitting here with a multi-talented actress, writer, comedian. You know her from her many projects, including her own podcast, The JV Club, and Nickelodeon's Legend of Korra. Janet Varney is here. Hi. How are you enjoying Kineticon? Uh, I'm having a great time. Everybody's so great. Um, I said this yesterday, but I really feel like, I mean, this is probably going to get me in trouble with some of the other cons that I've done, but I do feel like the questions at the panels were particularly thoughtful, particularly interesting, um, really great, smart, wonderful people here at the con. I love it. Well, let's hope my questions continue that trend. No pressure. No, <laughs> no pressure at all. Now, uh, Nickelodeon's Avatar franchise has been phenomenally popular for a very long time, so to be thrust in the middle of it with the central role of Korra might have been overwhelming, I would imagine. Yeah, you know, it, it definitely was. Um, the The funny thing about making cartoons is that you sort of make them in this kind of vacuum where nobody's really seeing it, and then um, it sort of spills out into the world, and you suddenly realize that it matters a great deal what other people besides the group of you making it uh, actually think about it. So um, I think I had kind of like, I got the part, I, I kind of had a sense that it was a big deal, although I wasn't as familiar with the fandom. I did love the first series. Um, and then I kind of, I don't want to say I forgot about that, but I kind of did forget about it because I was so enthralled with just the, the making of the cartoon. And then when, you know, it was announced and they started talking about the release date and all that, and there was a lot of buzz about, oh, is it going to be good? Is, who's, the, who's this person? Da, da, da. I suddenly felt like this immense pressure. But it's probably good that I felt that pressure when it was too late to do anything about it. Like we'd already recorded everything. That way I didn't sort of take that tension into the booth with me. Yeah. Now, you had appeared on other shows with passionate fan bases before, maybe not quite as passionate as Avatar, but you've made appearances on shows like Psych and How I Met Your Mother. Um, and for any aspiring actors watching, when you're coming in to do a guest spot on a show that is already known for its, for its uh, tight, well-cast, talented ensemble, what, uh, what, what's that like sort of coming in as an outsider for a week? Um, that's a great question. I've never been asked that before. So you are uh, continuing the trend of great questions at ConnectCon. Um, well, you know, I think what's great about those shows, uh, especially the ones that you mentioned, I would I would put Bones in there as well. Mm. That's got a great following. And also Warehouse 13, which was another one that I did recently, um, is that the cast and crews on those shows are just extraordinarily warm and welcoming. And I think that they really do. I like to pretend that the applause that we're hearing in the background is for me. Just people are listening really far away. Um, but uh, but they're just so warm and welcoming, and I think that they really that makes such a huge difference. You know, there are shows that you go on where uh, it's a bit colder for whatever reason, or it's a tight knit group, and you and you feel kind of excluded. I haven't had that experience very often, but um, but in, in in for some reason specifically, and you know what? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna venture this guess. I think that the shows that we've been talking about are as successful as they are for the same reason that I had such a positive experience doing it, which is that you can really tell that the cast and the writers are having a great time doing what they're doing. And I really think that that's um, very magnetic and it's and it spills over into the supporting cast and stuff. So um, I only had wonderful experiences doing those shows. And I, that's one of my favorite things is when someone knows me from Cora, but they're like, you know, they tweet me and they're like, I, I didn't expect, all of a sudden you were just, I was watching an old psych and there you were. Um, so I love that crossover. I think I think that's really cool. Now you also co-founded San Francisco Sketchfest, which has grown into a huge beast. Uh, it seems like just about everybody notable in comedy has appeared there. But uh, its beginnings were a little more humble. Could you could you talk a little bit about the evolution of the of the festival? Sure, sure. Yeah, I would definitely say they're very humble. You're putting it kindly. Um, we you know we were just. Uh, uh, three young kids, honestly, um, just we'd been doing sketch comedy um, out of uh, out of San Francisco State, and <clears throat> it was just really hard to find places to perform comedy in San Francisco. We didn't have like an Upright Citizens Brigade. There was um, a company called Bats, which is a great improv school, but everything they do is kind of self-contained, and so we were getting spots on like stand-up shows. 
And we were super sketch. Like we were, I mean, our name, Totally False People, was our, our sketch group name. And it came from a Mark McKinney quote. We were huge uh, Kids in the Hall fans. And the reason I say that is because we were like very costume and wig oriented. So we would get up on stage like dressed as these characters and stuff and people who were there to see stand up. It's like you don't want to see, you know, if you're there to see David Cross, well, that's a good example. That's a bad example because probably people like Mr. Show. But if they're there to see like Joe Rogan or something, they're not going to be, they're not going to understand what these like weird kids are doing. So we banded together with um, five other sketch groups that we had come to know in the Bay Area and said, listen, we need to find a space where we can perform we want to rent a theater for a month we can't really afford it if it's just us and we don't want to do that many of our own shows um we would love to present you guys and we can all kind of um trade our audiences by like programming you know two two groups two different groups two different groups and everybody will get a chance to perform with everyone else and um and we got like a ton of write-ups and stuff because i think we did have that sort of like you know, go for it spirit, and people knew we were this young, and they were like, oh, this is actually interesting, and we sold out all our shows, and Robin Williams came and saw, and, um, and so we were able to kind of grow the festival from there, but we, you know, we've made some ambitious choices, and, and I'm glad to say that we've never, like, lost money or anything, but um, it's definitely a labor of love, and uh, every year there's some, you know, we think we've got it together in some way and then some other thing goes wrong and we're like okay lesson learned that's another one that you just can't plan for you just have to like roll with the punches so it's been a good it's been an amazing training ground just to kind of like not have a business degree and still suddenly put together this festival now is there any guest you'd love to get for the festival that you just haven't been able to get yet well, anyone who's passed away uh, doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Um, Gr some, Graham Chapman's not yeah, showing up anytime there soon. There are some people that we are like, oh God, not that, for, not that we're like, if only for our festival, uh, but just heroes of ours that you know we didn't get the chance to meet that we were so sad about. But. Um, I mean, I, I think we've bandied about it's I don't think it's a secret that, you know, we would love to get a Monty Python reunion, but it's really difficult with those guys. So many of them are in England and, you know, constantly doing different things. And those, you know, those reunions happen um, someplace with like a huge presenter who has, you know, t like 20s of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So um so there's definitely some stuff like that, but I'm I'm really proud to say that, like, a lot of the people on our kind of wish list from you know, year two and year three, we've been able to bring those people through. And um, that's really a testament to the people who came and supported us early uh, because they were so generous with their compliments about what we were doing that, you know, it was, it, we, we established a sense of trust. When someone like Fred Willard comes out the mm -hmm. second year and is respected and loved by everybody in show business and says, these kids got something good going on, you know, we got a lot of yeses because of all those, you know, that word of mouth. So... Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Fred Willard. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, uh, you and Cole Stratton have also made a few contributions to Riff Tracks, and uh, you've sort of, uh, th they've all been hilarious. Thank y you. You tell Shelby Overman for me. He can take a flying leap at a rolling donut on a gravel drive. In a haunted can... ghost oh, town oh, on a oh, precarious mountaintop with an unforgiving climate. I'm not done. You've, you've sort of carved out an, a niche for yourself with these uh, 80s, early 90s, cult classic, some, sometimes a little campy classic. Well, what went into just selecting the movies you were going to riff? Um, that's a great question, too. And it's funny because we don't, it, it, we, we started to see that we were, like, I don't think we were really thinking about there being kind of an overall umbrella to what we were excited about. And I think even Mike Nelson pointed it out. He was like, boy, you guys are really uh, kind of uh, cornering the market on these uh, footloosey type movies. But, um, but yeah, I think those are just the movies, like, those are movies for us, and, and I'd be curious to know what, you know, the next generation, like, what those movies are for them, but those are movies that, to us, like, we will always love watching them, whether they're really good movies or not, and so when you can find something like that, because I don't think we're as interested in make riffing on movies like Bill and and uh and Kevin and Mike are so amazing at taking r truly dreadful movies and making them super entertaining. I think we tend to lean towards like 
you know, movies that we sincerely love, even though we're watching them going, I'm not sure this holds up. Like, this might not be as good as we think it is. And so those are kind of the movies that I think we've chased after. And then also, one of the cool things about Riff Tracks and what Mike did and what you see when you visit the website, and they have hundreds of great movies you can watch, is that it, they're not as concerned with doing only bad movies anymore. Now they're like, you know, we can make a great movie funnier. Um, and so that's that's kind of the page that we took when we did something like Poltergeist. Like, in no way are we saying that's not a great movie. It's an amazing movie. It truly is. And it's funny on its own. But we wanted to find, you know, it's sort of like once you've watched a movie enough times with your friends, because I think so many people who do like riff tracks are kind of just riffers, right? You know, it's just fun to watch a movie with a bunch of people and kind of just ad lib. Um, that uh, that that so that that was kind of like all right well let's let's start taking some movies that are actually kind of legitimately great and see what we can come up with. You've done a a couple of other web projects too. Uh, you co-created Neil's Puppet Dreams, which is a uh, Henson alternative series starring an actor that my viewers are probably familiar with. <laughs> Hi, I'm Neil. I sleep a lot, and when I dream, I dream in puppet. Ah. Uh. Neil's Puppet Dreams. <laughs> how, how did that come about? Well, that was, uh, yeah, that was really a dream come true, and I hope we get to make more. I know everyone wants to, but everyone's schedules have been kind of crazy, including, of course, Neil, who's now on Broadway. But, um, you know, Neil and I share an obsession with all things Henson. Um, we're huge nerds uh, for that stuff. We there's a there's a show that they've now turned into a touring show called Stuffed and Unstrung, but it used to just be called Puppet Up. And um, it was a program that was started um, for puppet improvisers. And so you would go to the theater and you would get to see the puppeteers. Um, you could see them puppeteering and the, everything was improvised. And they just had this huge um, library of puppets that they would like pull at random during these live shows. And Neil and I would go to those all the time. And, um, and then Nerdist and Chris Hardwick, uh, who's one of my dearest friends, um, started doing kind of a little bit of stuff with Henson. And it was just a perfect storm where, you know, Chris came to Neil and me and said, I know this is something that you guys have wanted to do and you've had this fantasy of, of doing something with puppets. Would you be interested in letting us kind of co-produce that? And we were like, yes, yes, yes. So, um, yeah, it was really an amazing experience. Like I said, I hope we get to do more. Another web series you were involved in, Burning Love, which has quite possibly the most impressive comedic ensemble I've ever seen in a web project. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, I was so honored to be a part of that crew. Oh, my gosh. Um, a lot of the time, I don't know, there's, there's just so many great little clusters of people making comedy, and, and a lot of the time you, you, know, you might be doing something else that so you can't participate, or something just gels together and you didn't happen to be around for it. And you're, I, I, for me, I, there's a lot of stuff where I'm like, oh, I wish I could have been in on the ground floor for that, that's so cool. And, uh, and Burning Love is really the example of like, sometimes everything comes together perfectly and you're super lucky and you get to be a part of it. I have extremely funny, talented friends like Aaron Hayes, who is you know, busy probably shooting a movie or something, who's like, I wasn't available for Burning Love. And like, she's so angry. Um, so I feel really, really, really lucky that that came together the way it did. Cause I don't think I've ever laughed so hard in my life working on something to the point where like, I was ruining other people's takes because I just couldn't stop laughing. And you've also uh, made quite a few appearances on America's favorite new time podcast in the style of old time radio, The Thrilling Adventure Hour, often as uh, Donna Henderson, Sadie's vampire friend. Part of why I called Donna is so you'd help me to not be a vampire so much as a person again. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean... Why would you want to be a dumb old vampire anyway? No, Donna, being a vampire isn't dumb. It's who you are, and you are lovely. I am? Oh. I love you to pieces, Donna Henderson. Mm. I, I am fond of you as well. You're one of my best wife's best friends. <laughs> oh, come here. Oh, oh hugging. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> when you're on stage with people like Paul F. Tompkins and Paget Brewster, how is it physically possible to keep a straight face? It's very hard. I feel that none of us do a very good job, in fact. Um, 
It all, especially if Paul breaks. If Paul breaks, all bets are off. I mean, I will cry with laughter if Paul breaks, and also when Patch breaks. Actually, yeah, there's just the, those guys are so funny, and they're more loose with their performances and their comfort levels than I think some of us who are guest stars. So um, we're like terrified to break, and so I think that terror pushes us forward into not breaking because we don't want to get in trouble. Um, but then when one of them does, uh, forget it forget it because it feels like it's permission and all that laughter that you've been holding inside because they're so funny just comes out and that just happened recently at the last one I did as Donna actually which is probably out as a podcast at this point um but something happened where I think Paget said a word wrong and Paul called her out on it and then we were the three of us were just like helpless for five minutes it was it was pointless to continue in some ways because we just couldn't stop laughing uh, let, let's wrap things up here with one more plug for your own podcast, The JV Club. Uh, it's, a, it's a very emotionally honest and vulnerable you know, talk about growing up in adolescence with some of everyone's favorite entertainers, uh, everyone's favorite women, and now men with the Boys of Summer in show business. Uh, any, uh, any big guests in the future you can, uh, you can hint at? Oh, that's a good question. Um... I mean, I'm not. I, I the the problem. What's funny is that I'm terrible at lining people up because of all of the other work reasons you just named. <laughs> um, so I think there are a lot of people that, uh, and especially with the boys of summer, you know, it's it's been such a joy to do it. And I don't. I'm not going to suddenly just do boys and girls year round. I just that just doesn't feel right to me. I love the idea of kind of returning to it every summer. So that's sort of my hope. But um, it is one of those things where like I haven't had to think about the, the, which guys I would podcast really. And then I turn around and I realize that there's like 500 guys that I adore who I would love to have. Um, I think uh, someone mentioned uh, that I should podcast Rob. Was it you? No. Uh, Almost seemed like no, it would. Brad Paulson, who's yeah, here at the festival. Your, yeah, um, I totally would do that in a heartbeat. So I hope to make that happen. Um, and uh, I think I'm probably going to have Paul and Storm. Nice. Um, those guys are are real good buddies of mine, and I'm going to get the pleasure of seeing them at, in San Diego. So that's definitely a plan. Um, and hopefully, we'll be able to like find the equipment and make it happen because I love those guys. They are pretty fantastic. Yeah. Um, Follow Janet on Twitter, at Janet Varney. Check out her podcast and her numerous other projects. Basically, just look around the internet. You'll probably stumble across <laughs> something she's done. Oh, I have one other thing I just want to give a shout out to, and that's this FX show that's premiering. It's called You Are the Worst, and it's from uh, an Orange is the New Black and Weeds writer, among right. other great things. And um, it's premiering July 17th on FX, and, uh, and I'm on it like the entire season, and it's, it's so funny and great. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, keep checking Geek Vision for more coverage from the convention and more other random videos. Uh, this is Dave signing off. And apologies to everybody trying to read here in the, uh, in the <laughs> Mongo library. <laughs>